I'll just remind you once again, pick a few random notes um, that aren't necessarily the most important things, but that sort of strike you as cool or interesting as we're going along, um, so that you can show them to your teacher, and he or she will be convinced that you've done the right thing by actually listening to this video. Okay, Galileo. Galileo, very cool guy. He's a big jerk. His best friend becomes a pope, and he still manages to hack off the Catholic Church so bad that he gets thrown in prison. Well, house arrest, not quite the same thing, for the rest of his life. He is a jerk. He's constantly going around telling people not only you're wrong, but you're stupid for even thinking that. And I can send you a proof that will convince even the dumbest. Oh, okay. You know? Send me the proof. Well, he never actually finished the proof or sent along. But he keeps insulting people who didn't agree with him. Nice guy. He was a spectacularly good technologist, meaning he could design floors or better places to arrange cannons or better ways to build wheels underneath cannon carriages. Um, somebody described the telescope to him, and even though he had never seen one, in 36 hours he had built the best one in all of Europe um, because he was so good at working with glass and trying different combinations and fiddling with stuff. He invented hand calculators, which is amazing considering they had no moving parts or transistors or screens, but you could still do cool mathematical tricks with them. Um, really great with technology. Um, with that telescope that he built, or maybe the second or third model, um, he was the first person on Earth to observe the moons of Jupiter. You can't see them with your naked eye, but you can see them with a reasonably good telescope. He saw them. Clear evidence that something else in the solar system besides the old Earth has moons going around it. That's a strong argument that maybe actually there's nothing special about Earth. Maybe Earth isn't the only thing in the universe with gravity. So if, the Earth, if, if Jupiter has its own moons and has its own gravity, maybe Earth could have its own moons and have its own gravity too. And maybe neither one of them is the center of the solar system. Maybe good old Copernicus was right about what is the center. Galileo, you will notice, lived at about the same time as Kepler. Have a look at those dates. Late 1500s, early 1600s. Late 1500s, early 1600s. They wrote each other letters from time to time. They would send one another copies of their latest books. Um, Galileo was a strong supporter of Copernicus. Kepler was a strong supporter of Copernicus. Um, so, obviously, these guys kind of liked having these confirmations with one another of what they were learning about the heavens. Now, Galileo is cool because not only does he observe the heavens, which lends support to Copernicus' mathematical model of what happens in the heavens, he also does really cool experiments, really sophisticated ones, especially considering he only had things like, you know, glass and marble and metal, no circuits, no, you know, fancy spring-loaded, automatic, electrical, anything. Nothing more sophisticated than an egg timer or a water clock, except some other things that he could build himself with gears or whatever else. But he did cool experiments, and he demonstrated the laws of earthly motion. First of all, it's a big deal that he did experiments rather than just relying on common sense or logic or occasional observations of that are already happening in the natural world. No, he did carefully invented experiments, little artificial mini representation of the real world as simple as possible with only one force acting or only one object moving or whatever. He did experiments to try and find laws of earthly motion. Spent years at it, but he was able eventually to come up with an idea called inertia. It was a radical idea. Nobody had it in history, or at least nobody really developed it into a theory and wrote about it in a compelling way like he did. But his idea was, if you had a perfectly smooth bowling alley, that bowling ball will roll forever. The natural tendency of an object in motion is to continue in motion. Now, of course, the natural motion, the natural tendency of an object at rest is to stay at rest. Everybody knows that. But objects in motion staying in motion, hey, that's a big deal. That's new. It's his idea. He gave it the name inertia. Newton liked the idea and used it as his first law and then wrote two more laws. Um, anything else about Galileo before we move on to Newton? Very famous guy, lots of books about him. Many of them are very interesting. Let's move on to Newton. Newton is so cool because not only did he do experiments like Galileo did, um, and not only did he study earthly motion like Galileo did and come up with laws for it, he had three laws where Galileo only had about two, but his laws actually showed that heavenly motion 
Kepler's laws. And Earthly motion, based on what Galileo did and what Newton extended about John, not only obey laws, they obey the exact same laws. Now that's a crazy radical idea because what do things in the heavens do? Circles, constant speed, forever. What do the things on Earth usually do? Straight lines, but only for a little while and then they stop. Doesn't sound that similar, but Newton figured out how they're actually both doing the same thing. We'll learn about, <clears throat> pardon me, we'll learn about all that later. It's a cool, crazy idea and unified all motion at the end of the every single set of laws. Other people still think he's pretty cool. The people who gave money to build this building thought he, thought he was cool enough that they wanted his name on it instead of their own. He also invented calculus. He also went insane. You can decide whether or not that's a coincidence. I'm going to pause again here just in case we need to break this video into a third chunk to get it down to a size we will fit on YouTube. Um, who follows Newton? Everybody follows Newton. Yes, there's a bunch of people between Newton and Marie Curie. Um, and this list is very roughly chronological. Um, yes, there's a bunch of people um, that are super famous in the physics world. You've probably heard of Marie Curie. You probably haven't heard of James Clerk Maxwell, so I left out a whole bunch. But everybody else is building on Newton's laws who does work in physics. Marie Curie, Luis Alvarez, this guy. Stephen Weinberg, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist who lives here in Austin, Texas. Um, some of you might have had dinner at his house, I don't know. Um, Richard Feynman, Carl Sagan, Neil deGrasse Tyson. This guy's been on the Colbert Report um, probably half a dozen times. And there's still room on the list for more famous physicists building on Isaac Newton. Here's a summary sheet. This is all stuff you really need to know for your next quiz. Within a century, you need to know all these times. So, if you write 4th century and it's actually 3rd century, yeah, close enough. But in the 3rd century BC or BCE, we've got Aristotle. He has a law for heavenly motion and he has a law for earthly motion. A few centuries later, we've got Ptolemy. I have a solid line connecting these two because Ptolemy is building on Aristotle and supporting Aristotle, but just adding a little bit of refinement and detail. Advancing in time to the 1500s, we've got Copernicus. Dash line connecting these two because Copernicus radically contradicts Ptolemy about everything, like what's at the center of the universe and how does gravity work and all that stuff. A short time later, in the early 1600s, we have Kepler and Galileo working at the same time. Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Kepler are all working on theories of heavenly motion. Galileo has a theory of earthly motion that contradicts Aristotle's. So we've got a broken line here. And not too much long later, Newton follows with a single set of laws that once again unites earthly and heavenly motion. And this one is based on algebra, supported by experiments, rigorously tested, um, explains all kinds of cool and subtle things like exactly when high tides are going to be and when the highest tide will be. Um, all kinds of stuff is explainable with Newton's laws. So Newton builds on Galileo and builds on Kepler, um, and everybody else follows Newton. So there's a brief history of physics. We're going to spend about half of our course this year looking at Newton's laws and examining the consequences of Newton's laws. Newton didn't know everything. He didn't get everything exactly right. His theory of light was really popular in his time, but kind of pretty troubled and wrong by modern uh, perspective. Um, he didn't know about energy. The concept of energy had not yet been invented. Um, and on the other hand, what he said about momentum is super useful. Even Einstein's laws or rules or equations or whatever that seem to contradict Newton's laws under certain special circumstances, like if you're moving really close to the speed of light, even Einstein's laws, which in some ways contradict Newton's laws, reduce to or give the same answer as are, are equivalent to Newton's laws under most everyday circumstances, things not moving close to the speed of light. So every one of y'all watching this, except maybe one or two kids, 
can use Newton's laws for the rest of your life anytime you have to think about motion or momentum or forces, and you'll be just fine. Go Newton. We love Newton. That's the end of the show. Thanks for watching. Make sure you bring your notes to class. Thanks.